This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. As we explore the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning, we see many headlines and remarks from friends about AI chatbots. These generative texts can be fun, but it appears there may be a reason to be cautious before you put them to work for you. To learn more, we welcome Ju Young Lee, a PhD student at Penn State's College of Information Sciences and Technology. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited about this podcast. <laughs> it's a very interesting research we get to dive in today. How did you first become interested in machine learning? Um, my interest in machine learning was actually inspired by my father. Um, he has been in, um, in finance district for almost like 30 years, and he was working as a data analyst. So his job was to uh, predict the job market based on the data. And when he was talking about like the stories that what happened in his job, like how data enlightened people and how it could be used to make better work. When I was little, I didn't really care that much. <laughs> and when I um, actually grew up and started to think more about my career, I was thinking, oh, I think this is a good way uh, for me to start my career because it has a really huge impact. So I decided to join the computer science department and then um, just kind of like did a lot of different projects and found my passion in data science itself. Yeah. How has NSF support impacted your research so far? Yeah, NSF support has been a very essential point to the success of my research. Um, specifically, not only did they support me to fully focus on research by allowing me to do the research assistant, and also it helped me um, get all the resources to run very computational heavy um, experiments, including cloud GPUs for model training. And lastly, um, it helped me attend the conference in person and actually get to talk about my research and share some insights with the, the fellow academia people. So in that sense, I believe um, nothing would have been possible without the NSA support. And also like being in this part of podcast as well is a very valuable opportunity. Uh, can you briefly explain natural language processing and natural language generation? What are those? Of course, yeah. So natural language processing is a field of computer science that focuses on um, understanding inter interaction between computers and human. So it's like training a computer to understand and interpret um, what humans are saying. So it involves a lot of different texts such as question and answering and also like text summarization, text generation, and also like sentiment classification. So this can all be done with a technique such as um, statistical analysis, deep learning, and even machine learning as well. Natural language generation, on the other hand, is a subfield of natural language processing, which more specifically focuses on generating texts that are that sound like humans. So, uh, for the popular applications, include ChatGPT that everyone is raving about, and also like Siri, the voice assistant um, that could talk to you and could give you help um, based on what your um, question is. I believe. These two fields are very um, important because it helps to bridge a gap between um, humans' communication and computing. So I'm very excited that people are paying more attention to these fields. Absolutely. And as the fields move forward and we get more and more involved with these things kind of cross-pollinating with each other, it's going to be very vital. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so what was your biggest surprise when you got into looking at how the language models are working? Um, the biggest surprise from my research is definitely we find that the models are capable of reproducing sentences and even ideas that were included in the training sets in a variety of form um, from just copying the strings exactly from the text itself. And also it has ability to paraphrase and even just summarize it into a shorter form. So that was I believe our work is the first to quantitatively analyze this behavior. Um, and another part that surprised me was the larger the model gets, the more plagiarism it occurs. And also more sophisticated decoding methods, which is related to choosing the next probable token when generating text, when it starts getting more sophisticated and starts to sound more like human, 
um, they tend to yield more plagiarism. I believe this is very alarming because the recent trends in the pursuit of this large, like billion parameters, language models with trying to figure out also more sophisticated ways for uh, models to choose the next token can actually violate um, people's authorship and also creativity and originality within the training corpus itself, um, although they have a good generation abilities. Um, can we backtrack slightly? How are these language models being trained? Can you talk about those data sets? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think most of the recent language models are trained on billions of corpus um, scraped from the web. So it is possible that when we write something on the blog or on um, on our Twitter, it could have been used as a training set. <laughs> and um, their training goal is to, given the text, they want to predict what could be the next probable token, which is also the same as the word. Um, so for instance, if the given input is what a wonderful blank, and we want to train the model to predict and sound like humans, then the model should be able to cap calculate the probabilities and um, predict the world or the world, yeah, the world um, should be the next probable token. Uh, whereas pig, what a wonderful pig. It's not a really common way for humans <laughs> to say. So that should not be encouraged for the models. So yeah, it's simply put, it's, it's, it's like just predicting the next token given the previous sentences. And um, so when they do the predictions, it's like baby, they don't really know what is the right common sense unlike humans. Right. So they, they just do trials and errors. And when we train, um, they by getting it wrong, and they learn and they start to get their guess closer to what is a common sense. So that process is done um, iteratively. And then um, all the training parameters in the models are also trained as well. And in the end, um, the model reach the capacity that the humans can also have. So yeah, that's the most of the training process. That's interesting. That made me think of when you use like a translate tool and maybe it gets there but maybe it's like slightly wrong and it like you're you're mentioning of the pig it's like maybe it's the wrong animal that it picked out of what the meaning is yeah so it takes time for model to actually like gradually learn and i know some of the translators before it was pretty poor but i think google translators have evolved so much as well it's probably because of all those like training sets that they started to create from the um internet Right, the more data that's in there, the more better data, it'll yeah, get, the more get to ability be. to learn. They got like a whole Wikipedia to learn from. So, <laughs> is there a way to avoid the plagiarism with the models? I believe there is a way. So, it could be done in a two different ways. So, from the user's perspective, um, it is very important to note that models are not perfect and they could make some errors. So from the plagiarism perspective, it's always good to double check if the AI generated text are plagiarizing or not. So you can use the existing plagiarism tools to kind of detect which part of sentences are plagiarized and then put the right citations like we do in the general writing uh, field. And another way is um, just start from AI generated text and then you have to somehow rephrase it in your own words. So you just not use that as the complete like your homework assignment you should be able to rephrase it um however i believe these methods are not a perfect solution because it's kind of like the damage is already done and you're trapped you have to take a lot of time to fix it so from uh from the perspective of engineers it would be better to train the model to kind of like print kind of like already know how not to plagiarize and put the right citations. And it's a very tough um, task, I believe. So if you actually ask ChatGPT to put the citations, they can, they can actually do that surprisingly. But when you double check if these citations are actually existing, they look, they look fine, but like it's not, it's fake. And <laughs> also, yeah, the reason, um, the recent method was kind of like, um, prompting the prompt. So you give more specific instruction, mm -hmm. giving a list of references like with the URLs and tell the model to put it in the right um, location. Then um, 
the model can actually do it. But the problem is these emerging technologies have not yet been very thoroughly evaluated. So we're not really sure this is this will suffice. So I think there are more room for growth. So I hope my work, AI plagiarism, could trigger or like um, inspire people to put more effort in this. I, I think is something that needs more um, knowledge and more um, engineering stuff to do. Absolutely. And and just thinking about how much people are using it to say write articles and this kind of thing, it's going to really bite people at a certain point if they're not being careful. Yeah, exactly. The, um, is There are like a lot of um, responsibilities that users should be aware of when they're using it because it brings a lot of comfort. It helps you with a lot of different tasks, but you could basically uh, be accused of plagiarism <laughs> just because of you trust model too much. So yeah, always right. good to be precautious. Yeah. And and as the technology advances, like I think the most recent version I've heard can take the bar exam even, which is pretty amazing. Uh, can we backtrack a little bit? I'm curious, how did you first come to the idea of looking into the plagiarism? Yeah, sure. Um, so as a PhD student, I read a lot of papers to come up with um, certain ideas. And one paper that I encountered when I was um, kind of like framing this idea was the memorization of um, training sets. So there are a lot of research areas that are focusing on the models, memorizing some of the personal information included, included the training set, and they omit it when they're like writing text. So from that perspective, my advisor and I were discussing, we're like, maybe models can even like do better than just simply copying and pasting. They could paraphrase and they could rewrite the ideas in the summary format. And this could be a very huge violation in terms of like the task that involves creativity. Like um, like you're writing a poem or you're writing a story. You don't want to plagiarize from someone's idea. So that initiated this um, idea, so-called like plagiarism. and. Yeah, I think that's how we got started. We started from this little um, similar project and then we kind of expanded the the scope. Right. So you're really digging in to see if this idea is in action happening. Yes. 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 Um, so th what are you looking at next? Are, is there a next step with the AI plagiarism? Are you trying it with different models? There's a bunch of different ones out there now. Yes, I am. <laughs> I am also, I'm also kind of like, I feel like I'm in a hurry to like do more like <laughs> analysis, but another core um, problem is my method requires training sets and it requires very good details about the models. But as you're aware of GPT-4, they are very, <laughs> they're very secretive. They don't really even report how many parameters they have in the model. They are not releasing the training set. So as the models are getting better and larger, the more like running scalable experiments is getting mm. tougher and as they're not being super transparent nowadays because it's a huge right. competition. So um, my next move is actually trying to fix the plagiarism by um, citing the references. And it's funny because af after ChatGPT, a lot of people are putting focus on like tackling this plagiarism. So there are like several other tools that already have enabled the model to cite the references. So from my perspective, now I have to find a new research topic <laughs> that, <laughs> is, that goes way beyond all of these competitors. So yeah, it's, 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 very, it's very exciting at the same time to see how people are like, like so hyped about this right. model because I've never seen anything like this during my academic career. So I'm excited. Um, but at the same time, I'm afraid as well because people are taking just my ideas. Um, so, yeah, so we're still a little bit exploring. I think there are still other um, related problems that models have, such as not being able to memorize the correct information is also mm -hmm. related to it could be expanded to plagiarism itself. So, yeah, right now I'm kind of like reshaping my direction towards better AI. Do you think that people can safely and responsibly use these language models in their day-to-day -day activities, in your work, in your class projects? Are these 
safe to use for students? Yeah, so I guess my answer is yes and no <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> The language models have a very wide applications, like you mentioned, writing an email, like writing some like report about something, and it could be effectively used to um, automate a lot of different processes that could help the business to reduce the manual cost it takes to do certain text. Um, but as I mentioned before, it is very important to remember that AI is not perfect. Language models are not perfect. Even OpenAI CEO has mentioned he's afraid that the model is going to produce disinformation and also even cyber attackers can leverage this tool to generate a source code to attack someone. So mm -hmm. it takes precautions and there are like a lot of responsi responsibilities for users um, on their end to be responsible about what their purpose of the usages and then like how their generated texts are being used. Speaking of like disinformation, you have to make sure that all of the stuff that AI has generated are act actual facts. That's like another thing that you have to do. And second, from the patient perspective, you also have to check if the models are not just simply reusing someone's idea and just tell you to like, just, you know, use it. So in that sense, I believe it's very cr critical for users to take responsibilities and be able to have a very critical eye to judge if the output itself is safe to use. It would be better if the models tackle all these problems by itself, but I think right now this is the best we can do. Just be precautious when you use a text from ChatGPT or other GPTs. <laughs> For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Special thanks to Ji Young Lee. You can watch an expanded version of this conversation on our YouTube channel by searching at NSF Science. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at NSF.gov.